Welcome in to EP Wealth's Informed Investor Market Update. We're just a little past July 4th, so we're into the second half of the year. Exciting times. The market's been in rally mode for a large part of the end of 2023, November and December. And through the first six, seven months of um, 2024, it's been pretty positive as far as the results go, but it's also been pretty uh, slanted. Joining me today will be Adam Phillips, Managing Director of Investments with EP Wealth. But before we get to him, let's talk a little bit about the report card that I like to start with. The NASDAQ for the year is up 22.3%. Now, again, that's heavily concentrated in the Magnificent 7. The S&P 500 up 16.7%. The Dow Jones Industrial Average up 4.5%. The S&P 400, that's mid-cap companies. Think not quite big, but also not quite small like Goldilocks. The S&P mid-cap 400 is up 4.1%, a pretty good number, except for when you compare it to the NASDAQ and the S&P 500. Now, the Russell 2000 is coming up in last, down two-tenths of 1% year-to-date, and that's where a lot of market um, speakers and uh, economists are starting to have problems with the stock market. It's too slanted. It's not a good market breath when the small cap's underperforming. Let's see if we can't get some commentary from Adam Phillips, uh, Managing Director of Investments at EP Wealth. Adam, that report card is pretty stark. Growth is doing great. Uh, the general market, S&P 500, is doing fantastic, up 16.7%. But those pockets of our 401k and the pocket of investments in the Russell and the mid caps, they're not carrying their weight, so to speak. Problem for you, or is it something we're just going to work through? You know, I I wish it weren't this way. I, I guess okay. we'll, we'll take what we can get, but... I think that if you're an investor that has the majority of your equity exposure in a handful of growth stocks, then you're pretty happy right now. Um, but if you're a diversified investor um, doing really arguably what, what you should and, and what history says you should, um, you know, you're kind of being held back. And so I think that's been frustrating for some people. The On an equal weighted basis, the S&P 500, meaning so maybe just, just to take a step back, the 10 largest stocks in the S&P 500, because of their dominance over the last couple of years, they've grown to represent, it's actually approaching about 40% of the S&P 500. It's, I think that the number is closer to 38%, but it's been on a, on a, a pretty good uh, increase here. Uh, so if you want to negate the impact that those handful of stocks have, on the the index returns, you can look at the equal weighted index, and that really just puts everyone on a on a level playing field, regardless of their size. Okay. On an equal weighted basis, the S and P five hundred is up about four percent, a little less than four percent year to date. So, obviously, underperforming the uh, the cap weighted measure of I think you said sixteen point seven by a pretty wide margin. So yeah, it, it's been frustrating, and it's. This happens, um, but it, it's not going to last forever. And so at some point we will see that rotation because, you know, eventually things get so lopsided. You look at valuations and on a relative standpoint, and the, I think you're going to see a rotation back to these uh, these companies and areas of the market that have been left behind. I think the question is, what's going to be that catalyst? Uh, maybe it's earnings season at, at some point, um, which we'll, we'll, I'm sure we'll be talking about later. But, you know, it's it's not... To me, I'd say it's more frustrating than anything else. You're, you're hearing more people talk about this, uh, suggesting that between this and elevated sentiment, this is a market that is showing some signs of fatigue uh, at least uh, over the short run. Historically, July is a pretty strong month. The third quarter uh, is, is not a, a great quarter historically. It's one of the weaker quarters um, on a historical basis. So maybe we'll see a little bit of a give up, a little bit of a pause. The market could take a breath here in the coming months. Uh, so we'll see. I, I will just say outside of those more common measures of index performance, one of the things that we're still watching is the price of Bitcoin. We were talking, I, I think we talked about uh, in one of our recent uh, updates, Rob, that we're using Bitcoin. We obviously, we don't invest, invest in it uh, on behalf of clients, but we do look at it and we think that it does help inform us of the the overall risk sentiment that's out there um, yeah. uh, among retail investors. And so if the market's rallying sharply we want to see confirmation of that uh in uh, of that risk sentiment in the price of bitcoin and so right now we're seeing the price of a handful of stocks in the S&P 500 rising meanwhile we're looking at bitcoin and it continues to fall that is not i think that's again just suggestive of weak breadth and maybe a, a, a little bit of a mixed picture here the price of bitcoin is about 55,000 right now 
down a little bit. Uh, I think that's the lowest level since February, down more than 20% from its uh, its recent high mm. uh, that uh, just about a month ago. That's a pretty sharp decline. And so if this continues, then I'd say that that could be something that we want to keep an eye on because it, it could be maybe the first sign of something uh, worse to come here, at least over the short term. I love it. I didn't realize you could use Bitcoin as a market sentiment tied towards the retail investor, tied towards how much speculation they're willing to take on, which bleeds over into the overall markets. Good stuff. Good stuff. Um, now you mentioned it. So let's play with it a little bit more. Um, earning season is going to begin in earnest this week. Um, I know Delta is going to report on Thursday. They're the airline that's going to be telling us how are we traveling or is there profits in travel? Are we, you know, burning through all of our cash and vacations? But then Friday, or it's my favorite day. It's when the big banks, JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, Citigroup start to report because I like listening to the CEOs talk in their conference calls and tell us what they're seeing. Um, what are we expecting out of the big banks and earnings season um, in the, the general sense of the, the idea? Well, I think generally speaking, the the expectations are are high this earnings season. I'm excited for Friday as well. Okay, uh, earnings uh, always really it, it always kicks off with the big banks, and so we'll get that on Friday, as you said. It's going to help, uh, I, I think, shed a little light on the state of the consumer right now and the overall economy. And so it's a great way to start the earnings season. And I'd say earnings are high. For, uh, expectations are high for them. They're 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 high for for the the broader market as well across the sectors. So on a year over year basis, the market's expecting earnings growth uh, to be up about nine percent. Uh, so if it if that comes to fruition, it it would be the the strongest year over year growth rate for an earnings uh, season uh, in over two years. Wow. And so we'll see. You know, I, I what we've seen is earnings expectations have increased here in, in recent weeks. And so um, this is not a low bar. Uh, so I, I think the you know, we, we could be opening up our, ourselves for disappointment or on the other hand, if if as we've seen in recent quarters, if these companies come out and and beat these estimates, uh, then we could see uh, stocks rise. We could see them that that could be the catalyst for another move higher. I'll say that I, I think it's not gonna, it's not going to be till further uh, along in the earnings season, but I, I think it's really going to be interesting for those higher flyers, those companies that have been participating in this strong move year to date, uh, and really going back to to last year as well. Yeah. Earnings season is the to, the time to justify these lofty valuations. Um, you know, with high valuations comes pretty uh, uh, heavy expectations, right? And so the longer this persists, the higher that bar becomes to continue to impress investors and justify uh, the current price level for your stock. And so we've seen in recent quarters how a handful of former high flyers have disappointed and their stocks fall 20% in one day. Um, so I, I think this, uh, you know, the, the further along we get in this bull market, um, the more these these uh, earning seasons really matter. Uh, and this one's going to be no different. I bring it up. Uh, you said the word bull market, and sometimes we forget we are in a ex period of expansion, and it's uh, it feels pretty good at this point in time. Um, now, you brought up the economy, and let's take a look back in time to last Friday with the jobs report. And then maybe let's look ahead to later this week. We get Thursday PPI, CPI, I think, and Friday is PPI, or do I have those backwards? That's right. Yep. So what do you uh, think about so, the jobs report from Friday? Yeah, so the, the jobs report, it, it was kind of interesting. It was, I'd say it's a mixed bag on the whole. I, I think it was, what the, I guess, the term that I've been using more recently is Fed friendly. Okay. Um, so looking at the numbers that we saw over 200,000 jobs added in the month of June, that was more than expected. But the caveat there is that we saw downward revisions of about 111,000 over the last two months. Yeah. Um, so that is not what you want to see. You know, these things can be a little bit noisy and obviously they're subject to revision. And so I think it's helpful to look at it on a three month rolling average basis. Mm -hmm. And so now that we have June's number, uh, we can look at the, the average over the last three months, which was the second quarter. Average job growth per month during the second quarter is about 176,000. Okay. And it was about, let's call it 265,000 in the first quarter. So we're seeing a, a meaningful deceleration and softening in the labor market. We also saw the unemployment rate tick higher to 4.1%. It's still pretty low, right, by historical standards. But on a, th this was a third consecutive month that we saw the unemployment rate tick higher. It was 
it's it's moved higher by 0.1%, so one-tenth of a percent in each of the last three months. And so I'd say that this is now um, a trend. Um, it's not a one-off. And so the Fed is looking at this. And what we saw in response to this was that the market started to price in more firmly uh, or more, more confidently to rate cuts uh, between now and the end of the year. But before that, it was kind of you know, wavering between one, maybe two rate cuts. Uh, and now it, it looks like two rate cuts is, is what the market is expecting, with the first one coming as early as September. Um, and uh, and so I, as we look forward to uh, to the inflation data coming out this week, it, it starts with the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, on uh, on Thursday. What what economists generally are expecting is for this to be another um, soft number that that supports the Fed uh, eventually cutting rates. Um, the expectation is for on a month over month basis uh, for prices to rise uh, 0.1%. And so pretty soft. Uh, and, and so, you know, the one thing that I will say is we just look, take a step back from, from these two data points, and just more broadly, the data that we've been seeing is, has been generally softer. There's a measure that we look at, it's called the City Economic Surprise Index. Okay. And, um, and, and so this number is, is now the lowest it's been in, in two years, which the, the way to interpret that is that the data that's been coming out continues to surprise the downside. Okay. Whenever we're getting these data prints, whether it's a weekly measure, monthly, quarterly, the market has its expectations going into it. And so the, the, most of these, uh, the, the actual results that we're seeing are missing the expectations. They're falling short of expectations, which is suggestive of a slowing economy, um, which really gives the Fed... Uh, arguably that the support that they need to uh, to cut rates here in the coming months. Now you just talked about the Fed cutting rates and it's been kind of a crazy year. I'll be quite honest with you, Adam, where we started the year with expectations of six cuts. Then we got down to three, then two, then one, then zero. Now it sounds like we might be back in play for two. Um, I'm glad you're watching this and not me. Um, speaking about watching, Jerome Powell is going to make a trip into uh, Capitol Hill this week for a two-day Senate banking yearly um, question and answers where he gets kind of grilled by the Congress people and uh, a lot of sound bites come out of it. Uh, then we get Jackson Hole coming up later this year. Are we on Fed watch for these um, two rate cuts? It, it, it feels like it from the media perspective, but I'd like to get your institutional perspective. I think that's right. You know, the, this testimony this week, I I watch it. It's kind of painful to watch because yeah. I think a lot of it is showboating more than anything else. Um, there I said it. But um, mm -hmm. but yeah, I mean, it is interesting just to see if if uh, Chairman Powell goes off script in some way. And so I, I think it, it does bear watching. Okay. Um, you know, that over the coming months, we are going to be obviously we're approaching the election in November, um, sure. who ultimately uh, represents the the Democratic Party uh, in in the presidential race at the top of the ticket. Obviously, that's still an open question, but um, but I think that that's going to obviously be top of mind for a lot of people. Mm. Oh, in the coming weeks, I think we're going to see a lot there, but I think a lot of it is noise. I think what really matters to markets here uh, is what the Fed is doing, uh, and so yes, I, I think it is going to be really important to just kind of watch. We are on Fed watch. I'd say the other one that you mentioned is the Jackson Hole event uh, coming up in August. And I think that's more, you know, it's more, definitely more important than this testimony that's that's this week. You know, historically, um, the Fed has used the Jackson Hill, uh, excuse me, the, the Jackson Hole conference to um, to discuss uh, future policy changes or, you know, that that's their form to make these big announcements. Um, so that could be the time where. They, you know, they they could in August if the if the data continues to uh, to support this, they could use Jackson Hole as the opportunity to say that they're planning or preparing to cut rates in September. So they give investors that warning, that heads up. They actually cut rates in September, and they they're kind of off and running. So they're always trying to find that line between um, uh, between giving investors kind of enough of a heads up, not to front run things, but they also don't want to surprise them either. Uh, and so it's this it's this balance, what they call forward guidance. And so I, I think that's what's going to be interesting about Jackson Hole uh, next month.
Well, we've got an exciting back half of the year coming up with obviously the political elections, but also with potential rate cuts. I'm happy that you're on top of all this, Adam. I highly recommend anyone watching this video today to reach out to your wealth management team and um, always be in communication because the year does go by fast. I can't believe we're already in July, more than halfway done. I'm Rob Black. Uh, for EP Wealth's Informed Investor Market Update. He is Adam Phillips, Managing Director of Investments with EP Wealth. We'll talk to you soon. Good day.